So a warm welcome to the how-to, warm welcome to Berlinale Talents, and uh, also a warm welcome to what we call a collective gathering. So because as you know, as you can see, no, you can't see it. It's about world building. Um, we have uh, collectives as the big topic this year, which means um, that also, of course, the 255 talents work collaboratively, collectively together. But we also invite the audience to join us into that. So you are kind of safe there in the moment, but I guess in a while, we also need you down here, if you want to. But um, it's very important for us to break those hierarchies, uh, to actually think about why and how we can uh, work together more closely. And also, of course, if it comes up to storytelling, which is it all about today, and I won't reveal anything, uh, who are the like this uh, authors of those stories really. Um, without any further ado, uh, I introduce you to a wonderful arena of people um, there isn't really a moderator, it's very important to say that. There's only experts, you are the experts, those people are, there are also more here. And there's one wonderful person, he's next to me, is Juan Diaz B, who will guide you through it. Juan, have fun. Thank you very much. Thank you, Florian. Okay, um, what a good introduction to say that this is exactly that. There's no experts here. There is a bunch of expertise in the, in the place. So we have some special mentors that have helped us guide the process, and I will introduce them to you in a minute, um, and that have brought their own experience into it. But the idea is that every one of you will bring your own point of view. Um, so to give you a context, I will explain what world building is on our side and what we have been developing. But also, and more importantly, I will explain you why you are here and the process that we have been already doing for uh, one closed session of the studio and that will continue with you in here in terms of work. A little introduction of what we are doing and very fast so that you understand. These are our guests, Itamar Kubovi. He's a theater artist. Eva Yamin, it's a visual artist and research-based um, history hacker. And Sergei Gebstein, it's a cognitive scientist. And they will, they will introduce themselves briefly and, um, so that you understand why they are here and what perspective they are building. But more importantly right now, it's what we're doing here. So there's two things in this room right now. The theme, narratives of control, which we all explore together very fast in the continuation of what the process was, and the methods, world building. So we have been collaborating with the Berlinale Talents for already 10 years doing a studio in which we bring the methods that we have been developing, and a lot of our method actually has been explored and experimented here in this room in different subjects, and we have brought a, a set of tools to what we call tools to augment imagination, to bring new strategies and new ways of structuring our creative processes. The director of the institute and the person I have been collaborating for 13 years now creating these methods is Alex McDowell, who maybe you know from Minority Report. Um, and this particular film has been kind of an icon within the process of understanding how to bring new methods into um, creative processes, filmic processes, and other platforms, because in this movie there was no script before the beginning of the building of the world. And what Alex did that was like breaking the system was to bring architects, to bring scientists, to bring people that would think about the future to build what he calls future reality. And that was the breaking thing. It was not about speculating on something in terms of science fiction, but about building a reality that will have a logic of its own. And this is what we tried to do. We tried to build tools so that we can describe a world and the, the stories emerge from that world. <clears throat> and our theme, our theme is narrative of control. So I made a short definition of what narrative of control to trigger you. It defines a network of stories that drive many of our actions and choices without us truly realizing it to maintain the paradigms of power. At the root of our ideals of success, our images of failure, and existential fears, there are tales designed to control us. They brought our present to manifest, and they will bring a version of the future to emerge. And a version of the future is key, because the future is not one, it's a version of many that are possible. 
So it's about what future are we manifesting with the actions that we are taking. In terms of production and the idea of rebuilding and why it's important for us, it's how can we break this to this, from the linear in which an idea brings to a script and brings to a director, to a collective process in which the story, this world that we build through world building, it's the, the essential part from the inception of the story until we present it to the audience. It's about the story. So we describe it like this. It's a narrative practice in which the design of the world precedes the telling of a single story. The richly detailed world becomes container for narrative. And all stories emerge intuitively and organically from the core. And what we call sculpting imagination into existence. We think spatially. We don't think linearly. So what we're trying to do is create methods in which we bring that essential comprehension of narratives through our bodies into space and into the stories that we create. So we have been working all this time to try to create a spatial language, some metaphors and new terms that allow us to tackle these strategies. For that, we bring people from very different disciplines. As our mentors here, they come from completely different disciplines, but in our processes, we bring people from all kinds of areas of knowledge. And the Institute, that it's a collective in itself, it's a network of people from very different disciplines that are investigating and are questioning the way that we use narrative in our daily life, but also can, how can we use that to create new stories. This is a description of how we will think a world, a world that is connected between the macro scale and the micro scale, in which the energy of the cell is connected to the energy of the system, in which we can ask what is the health of our city as a way of understanding the questions of the micro scale of our body and say our body emerges as an ecosystem of multiple cells and tissues and becomes what we know as I. But at the end, it's an ecosystem in itself. The city is the same. So we could ask questions from the micro and from other disciplines into the macro and vice versa. And like this, we bring into the table not the imposition of lack of knowledge, but the live knowledge of people that have already processed the information. So this is about enhancing collaboration. It's about bringing people that have other points of view, but also other kinds of questions. Because when we learn a particular discipline, what we learn is how to question a problem from a different angle and a different process. We will take this in consideration as well today when we're working. The idea that a world can emerge or we can start comprehending it from a point of view, from a character or from the environment itself and its logic, because it's all one ecosystem that emerges progressively. This brings us to the idea of switching and changing metaphors. So this is something that I define as documenting fiction. And in that, because I'm a writer and a filmmaker and a designer myself, started thinking, what is the role of someone that is writing? And when I was designing a world with someone else, or I was in the moment of trying to understand my world, I realized that when I, see, I was sitting to understand the story I wanted to tell, I worked more as a chronicler, not as a writer that is trying to invent the world in the page, but someone that was negotiating its experience of a world that existed. And this is precisely how, from building the world into telling a single story, we can just change the metaphor of how we work. And this is important. I'm going to show you some concepts that we, we show already to our group very fast, and you will keep them in your mind, and we want to keep the conversation with you. But today is not about that theory. Those are tools to augment imagination. Today, it's about liberating your intuition, about changing your ways of seeing things and to think the subject matter. And this is the main concept in which I have defined my own way of approaching world building and the methods that I have tried to evolve. And it's based on the idea of narrative emergence. I'm going to skip a couple of videos that I have. But basically, in nature, we can see this narrative emergence happening a lot. And we will try to emulate these emergences in which there's no one particular leader, but the variations of any of the, the individuals on that particular um, group changes the shape and the complexity emerges from those minimal variations. Both creativity comes from there, because the way that we are creative in our brains comes from all the system in ourselves that emerges as a consciousness, but also the narrative of control, 
work like this, because minimal variations make that we assume certain patterns of behavior. This is beautiful, but I'm going to skip it. This is just how a cell brings, at the end of this beautiful video, a salamander to exist from these multiple subdivisions. So it's how one scale brings us to a different scale. And this is the point, how the vibrations, the motion, the ideas on one scale produce the next and the next and the next in a multiple scale representation and emergence. And then we can see ourselves as individuals, but also we can think of our health and the way that we behave as an organism or as an environment. So we can think of all what is happening inside of us as an environment that produces the emergence that we are. In the same way, we can think of a city. But in the way that we are telling a story, we think the same. Our characters are a byproduct of the environment that contains them. So in terms of writing a story, designing a space, of creating the collaboration in audiovisual kind of narratives, we are thinking how that it's an emergence of all the relationships of the world that we get to know. And how a collaboration is essential to really understand that creative ecosystem in which we are bringing a story to life. It's not about a single journey of a single person. It's about understanding the multiple relationships of that ecosystem. And that is brought from a particular set of tools. This is one that I'm bringing to you because it's important for what we're doing. And it's basically how you change your mind from the mind of the programmer to the mind of the explorer. The same way that you can see the world from above, and it allows you to see the patterns on how the city behaves, you can walk the city in the streets. But it's two different mindsets. So it's the mindset of the programmer and the explorer. And you can always see the same thing from a different perspective and find new questions. And then understand that there is this variation between how the person becomes an, a, a multiplicity of cells moving or becomes the person that moves in the city. And then that person that moves in the city becomes a flow that makes the city itself. So what we do when we are doing world building is not just keeping what we know. It's starting to ask questions from very different disciplines and start seeing where are we missing a spot. And this is important for the process. Leadership doesn't equal single authorship. And that is because we are a costume in the way that the market and the way that we have understood film, that the director or the writer are the ones that hold the authorship. But the truth is, that in any process that is collaborative, the ideas come from everywhere. And the fact that there is a leader doesn't mean that that person is the single author of that story. And if we challenge that, we are empowering people to collectively work with a different entitlement than when we are telling them to follow only our authorship. And this is something that we're going to have today because we have limited time. And it's what I call the principle of motion, which is basically sometimes we're going to open the space and this is the question that comes always. How do you make decisions in a space in which collaboration works like this? The principle of motion. A caterpillar tenses and expands. A heart compresses and expands. It's always like that. So when we are going to make decisions, we make them and we expand as well, again, the space of creation. And then we compress again and we take decisions and those decisions become the ground in which we all again expand to have collective imagination. And more impor importantly today as well is to put your ideas in front, to imagine by putting in front, not by keeping it in your head, not by having the, the answers to everything, but by putting them in front and having questions. And this is what we're trying to break. It seems simple, but at the end is the essence of what we are doing, trying to change the paradigms of how we work and the, the paradigms in which the idea of being a genius, the, being a, the idea of being talented, the idea of being the author is driving us to actually break um, the collaboration and the possibility to create. So this is what we're trying to achieve today. And we are going to achieve it only with you. Narrative emergence and collective storytelling. And hopefully we arrive from the narrative of control to the initial ideas of how can we resist those narratives. So this, as I said, is the initial introduction to something that is complex, that is a new method, but what it's offering really is new strategies to think things, new metaphors to approach stories. So we're going to try to experience that now on the tables. You see four tables, those that are there, 
Um, there's still some, some seats around because the process is going to happen mostly on these tables. Then those that are there that can circulate if you don't have a, find a, a chair so that you can see the process that is happening on the tables. And I will be guiding that process initially. But first, we're going to actually have a process in motion because actually when we move, we think differently. So Itamar is going to help us guide that process. Arnie. Thanks, Juan. Hey, everyone. I'm Itamar Kubovi. I uh, ran a dance company, Palabolus, for 15 years. Very interested in horizontal hierarchies and in collective storytelling. And one of the things that makes a collective group able to tell stories together has to do with being in the same space and being able to uh, share. And we're going to do that by moving together. I'm going to ask each of these tables to work with me very quickly, take the cardboard chairs and the table, assuming there's no wires on the table, so it doesn't re relate to this one, and move them all the way right now, table and all the white chairs, to as, much, as far out on the sides of the wall as you possibly can, and then meet me in the middle of the room. Let's do that right now, and you can all join us in the middle of the room as well. We'll bring the tables back in a few minutes, but we want to create some space for all of us. What's that? I don't know. Microphone. 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 Be careful with the microphones. Careful with the microphones on the table. With, with all the cabling, we, maybe we can circulate around, but that's fine. We'll Otherwise, yeah. Just leave it as it is. Beautifully done. Okay, let's gather, and what we're going to start to do, and I invite again everyone up there to join us, um, we're going to start walking. Nothing I'm going to ask you to do involves anything more than walking. But we're going to all start walking. Don't all walk in the same direction and try to create as just a continual flow of walking going through the center and around. Don't bump into each other. Don't move too quickly. Try to get it all to just be a moving mass of bodies walking in a confined space. Go ahead. Explore the middle of the room, try not to follow anyone, work alone, and then explore the edges of the room and see how far to the edges you can go. And when you're ready, come to a halt. Change direction and start walking again. Now try walking a little bit more quickly. But again, be predictable. Don't do anything too erratic. Try not to bump into anyone. Very nice. Now think about your eyes and think about where your eye line is directed. Try to look down at the floor and notice the feet walking by you, the shoes walking by you, the way in which those feet appear, and still maintain a predictable path that allows you not to bump into anyone. Listen to the weight that everyone is putting on the floor all together in this room. And let your eyes slowly crawl up the body until you're actually looking into people's eyes.
Hold eye contact with whoever you're encountering as long as possible. And change direction. And stop. Everybody close your eyes. If you have ever been in love, start walking. You can open your eyes, sorry about that. <laughs> and if you've ever been heartbroken, stop. If you were born in Europe, start walking. And when you're ready, stop. If you were born outside of Europe, start walking. And when you're ready, stop. Everybody start walking. If you have disappointed someone in the last three months, stop. And if you have disappointed yourself in the last three months, stop. And to those who have not disappointed anyone or been disappointed, when you're ready, stop. Let's get our tables and bring them back to position. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. For, for those of you that are there, there is still seats, please come and then join the tables. There is one, two, three, four, five, six. So please join the tables because most of the process we're going to be closer to the tables.
Here there is a bench, so you can take it somewhere. And there's another one here. Great. So the next step is to show you what we have been working on. What we have been working on departed from um, personal stories that each of the members of the studio in our session brought to us. And they basically very openly and very generously told us a piece of their lives in which a moment, uh, a, a narrative of control took uh, power over them, their actions, or brought them to choose in a different way. So we, our exploration started there. And then we have craft, crafted four stories. Each of the group is exploring one narrative of control differently. So we're going to hear those narratives of control. And in, on each of the tables that you're seated, we're going to explore one narrative of control particularly. How we're going to do it? We're going to do it by trying to understand the relationships of different scales of that narrative of control. How the narrative of control of being good or of disappointment or the one of success, it's bringing us to um, change the way that we are choosing, but also how that has an effect on different scales. The community, the way we interact, the city, how it emerges, and the nature of that city and the health of that city. So we're going to go group by group. You're going to hear that brief story, and that is going to be the center point. And then the people that were part of the process before are going to guide the questioning so that we learn more from all of you and what you bring to the table. When you feel related to that story and the new questions that we can make into finding the relationships on each scale. Okay? So we're going to hear from the stories. Let's going to start with that group. <laughs> Did I expose you? One thing about what happened just before while we get ready for the story. You saw how when we are moving, the patterns that change transform the rest as in the flocking, right? This is how collective storytelling works, but also how narrative of control works. One thing that changes transforms the rest of the flow, right? But on the other side, did you see at some point when we were asking something that is not so concrete, not if you were born here or there, disappointment or love or heartbroken, there was a hesitation. There was a moment of, I don't know if I can answer that question. In, and, and this flow, it's partly why we are actually losing a lot, of our, a lot of our energy through the narratives of control. Because it's when we actually don't know how to fulfill those patterns. We don't know how to control ourselves within those images that we are pursuing. So this is what we want to explore here. So bring your own lives, your own questions into each of the stories, okay? So, ah, do you have a microphone there? Yeah, cool. Okay, uh, hello everyone. So um, we ended up with this uh, small story by sharing everything together and mixing it up. So let's go. Um, Stand up. Yeah, sure. <laughs> of course. Um, there once was a timid young boy who was with his friends in an abandoned power plant. This power plant was in a forbidden zone, and they were all terrified but pretending to be brave. At some point, they came across the nuclear core of the plant. There was a ladder to reach a broken bridge that crossed the nuclear core that one couldn't see the bottom of. At home, the young boy was forced to take care of his five siblings because his busy parents were never around and he was burdened by this sense of responsibility at a young age. As there were no, fa as there were no father figure for the child, he had to... Uh, sorry, I start again. As there was no father figure for the child, he had to construct his own idea of masculinity through the media consumed. He watched the movie Hook one night with his siblings and came to the idea of alpha masculinity through adventure and spontaneous behavior. He saw an opportunity to break free and do something spontaneous by crossing this bridge and an opportunity to gain the spotlight. In the middle of the crossing, he got vertigo, but even despite this, he crossed the, the other side of the bridge. After he crossed, he sees that his friends were filming with their smartphones, they put the video online and it goes viral. The young boy finds pride and validation in this approval and becomes addicted to his daredevil image and he becomes an international stuntman influencer. He consistently ups the ante 
until he attempts to climb the world's largest building without harness. And well, this is an open ending for now for the pitch. Okay, thank you very much. So what are the main points of that story for the other ones that were writing the story? Like, so that we share a little bit the mic. What were the main points that brought you to construct that particular story? Um, the main points were the ideas that um, we are either constricted by the, we are constricted by the ideas of extremes. Um, we either have to be one thing or the other. This is a duopoly that's often portrayed in storytelling, kind of simplistic view of the world. Things are black and white, good or bad, and we're often constrained by this very um, simplistic idea of human existence. Sergey, do you want to contribute? Yeah, we were exploring the notion that usually the stories are told from the perspective of a single dimension and uh, some polarities involved. Uh, we considered every single story in our larger circle and we were rather uh, amazed by how in every single case we reduce our stories to single dimensions. Even though as you consider the context of the story in a larger society, it immediately becomes multidimensional which brings us to this very interesting theme of how multiple stories fit together in the larger society as we communicate our stories to one another. Yeah. Um, on the mic is Sergei um, Gebstein. And um, can you give us a little introduction, very brief, to your field of work so that we know on that table what is going to be our perspective? Okay, certainly. I'm, uh, I'm a scientist. I study uh, visual perception and how uh, our senses control behavior, active behavior. One of the key themes in this endeavor is called perceptual organization. It's a field of research that draws ideas from early 20th century Gestalt psychology or larger phenomenological movement. By and large, it's about how our brain, or our bodies create meaning out of raw sensory energies. So in a way, we study how what we perceive as reality, as a sort of ongoing story of reality is constructed by our brains and our bodies. So you could think of that as a seed of narrativity. Great, thank you very much. And that's, as we were saying, it's about bringing different perspectives that can give us a different kind of take on things. And there's one very important part that we were discussing with Sergei on bringing to the table, and it's the idea that we are constantly calibrating our reality. That this flux that we were studying before, when we are seeing it in the... One second, give me one second. Let me, let me, let me just finish. <coughs> and then the, the idea that um, these flux that we're, we're variating and we're changing precisely are micro variations that in these calibrations of the story, we start moving in a different way. So that we don't understand that the narratives of control are just these massive messages that will transform us just with one exposition. But there is these micro variations that actually are gonna bring us to shift into a different direction and flow in a different way. So, so that we understand where we are going with the exploration. Okay, now let's go. Okay, so my group wrote this little story. Uh, Sophia wakes up at 5.30 in the morning to get to work first. She always wants to prove to herself and everyone, everyone at her job that she is the best, or at least trying the best. She did not sleep well because she is thinking of everything she's going to have to do the next day. She eats breakfast in the car, which is a black coffee with three sugar cubes. She is exhausted. She's becoming more worried day by day about being vulnerable and feeling like she will be judged. So she cuts herself at work by a mistake. Is in pain. She's risking infection, but she does not want to fail, so she hides it. She's an assistant costume designer, so she puts a glove on to hide her hands, her injury. Uh, she wants to, because she wants to impress the lead costume designer. She is working on a, a, a piece, a costume piece, and she has stained the piece that she's working on with blood, so she now has to start over. Her grandmother always told her to work so hard, and now she's beginning to ignore the injury. She has a breakdown, 
Someone takes her to the hospital. She is on the bed, and her grandmother comes to visit. And her grandmother says, these are working hands in sort of a prideful way. So that was our story. OK, thank you. Do you want to complete any of the points that were brought into the story from the group? Uh, well, we want to talk about vulnerability and how, as a person, we change our behavior uh, not show our vulnerability. So uh, that was the main concept we work on. And maybe my friends can help me with more. The concept. So we were, um, the concepts of vulnerability and how does that affect uh, the working place and our society. So especially we are all working in the creative industry, so it's a very competitive work. And what we realized that it's very hard for, because people are scared to um, express if they are in pain or they have any difficulties, they don't talk about it. So we start working in places where everybody seems they are the happiest in their job, they are fulfilling their dreams, and they don't show weakness. For that reason, we think we don't need, we, Nobody else is weak, so we can't show our own weakness. Therefore, conversations are not happening. And maybe I think one of the things to talk about is that, is it true that in the creative phase, it's full of people who are trying to prove themselves to be the best? Is it a type of work which attracts these type of people? And if you recognize it, how, how can we solve this issue? How can we talk about it by accepting that we are a bit more sensitive than other people? And also to try to express vulnerability and think about it as a strength instead of as a weakness. OK. Is there any, any, anything else? OK. Let's move to another story, but that was great. Um, here, who is going to share the story with? Do you have a mic? Thank you. Hello. Um, so Clara was um, living a really, really busy life. She always uh, went from an appointment to the next one and never spent so much time home. And one day, she came home really late on the evening and um, noticed something strange in the flat. The cat from her roommate was um, meowing all the time, like um, he, she hasn't been fed. And um, she went to the room of her roommate and discovered that it was empty. Her roommate um, obviously <laughs> disappeared and left the old lady cat over. So uh, suddenly Clara found herself in this situation where she had to deal with this cat and take care of this cat that wasn't hers. And at first, despite of her like, super busy schedule, there were certain approaches to be nice to the cat, but the cat was a complete asshole cat and just refused all of this and was just a massive pain in the ass. Also, when it came to visitors, the cat was always like scratching them and destroyed like, uh, a lot of her clothes and so on. So the cat like, really started to be a problem. The roommate would never show up again. And somehow, Clara also started feeling that the cat was um, responsible like, for all of the bad things that were happening to her and just like, gave her way more stress than she already had. And also, uh, the question like, really came up, where did she allow herself to just be in this position of this cat sitter, of like, this roommate who disappeared, who never ever gave her a call, what's going to happen, or sent some money to take care of this cat? So this cat that was such a pain in the ass, um, something, there was a small change that she started to notice in the cat. Um, it, it wasn't, you know, clawing anymore. It wasn't uh, staring her down when she'd walk into the room. And she started to feel that something was wrong. And although her life was a mess, the apartment was a mess, her job was a mess, everything that was going on in her life was just going down she noticed that the small detail in this cat that she'd learned to hate so much, um, that something was wrong and an instinct took over where she 
shoved the reluctant, reluctant cat into the box, took it to the vet across town, and then found out that the cat had six months to live. And in that moment, something that she wasn't aware of began to take place where, well, the first thing she noticed is that the cat was more cooperative in this, in this last little bit of time. Um, she goes online, she reads up how to, how to save an old cat. What can you do? Da, 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 coconut water. She finds coconut water. She goes out in the middle of the night, gets coconut water, drip feeds it to the cat. And in that, she was kind of curious about coconut water. She gives herself a couple drops. Over time, she nurses the cat back to health. And through nursing the cat back to health, she's finding that she's taking a little bit care of her, better care of herself, a little bit better care of her apartment and her surroundings. And um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the cat starts to get better. The cat starts to uh, treat her better. They become like best friends or something. <laughs> and she starts to invite her friends over again. The, the cat starts to be nice to her friends. Their friends realize that she's being nice to them as well. Uh, she starts to take her be better care of herself. And um, she learns from the cat that she needs to pay attention to herself. So she ch changed to a different job that makes her happier. She starts to exercise. She starts to clean the house. And she starts to get a better life for herself. And the cat didn't die. The cat's <laughs> alive. <laughs> so what, what were you trying to tackle with that? What were the main questions to the story? We talked about sense of responsibility and um, at what point do you take responsibility, not, for your, not only for yourself but for others. And, um, and also sometimes that how uh, taking care of somebody else can uh, cause that a lot of peop uh, more people take care of you because you become part of the community and you started knowing the mechanisms of caretaking, of dedicating time to people which is not, or to uh, animals or whatever kind of um, things, uh, beings with feelings, and how this like also causes that you might take more atten pay more attention to yourself. Yeah, thank you. Okay, let's move to our final table here. So who is gonna start with the story? Hello. So, um, so the stories start with a little girl. Uh, she, she's the daughter of a poet and a writer. And uh, one day um, she was going to her neighbor's house and she goes to the attic. And this neighbor is a very close family friend and in the neighborhood, everybody's very friendly to each other. And then she goes to the attic and uh, she finds out that in, in, the, in this attic, it's full of it's, it's stacks and stacks of books and poems and she starts reading some of them and one of the books that she found was her father's book and this was a book of poems that um, writes about like nature and you know the beautiful country and just a bit basically about like how he loves his country and such and but like it, the strange thing was that all the poems were uh, were underlined and circled and certain words were circled and there were question marks everywhere and she didn't understand it and she went back home. But then three years later, um, she found out that her father was part of this like uh, movement of artists that was writing about like how they felt about this society and about um, the world around them because their country just came out from war. So there was a very confusing time and they were being honest and talking about it. And in between the words about nature and everything, he inserted his feelings about his country and how he felt. And um, he's um, and because of this, uh, his um, their neighbor was actually working for the government, and uh, they were the ones that were underlining and circling all these um, artist work and um, putting them on list. And uh, after this um, three years, her father was sent to to educational camp, and um, yeah, and then she. She, she realized then that like um, her father was part of this movement and she, yeah, she didn't know how to 
to, to react to this. So after this, uh, she becomes a little bit scared about uh, political, uh, getting involved in political issues because of her father, so she hides to everyone her story and tries to not to talk about uh, her, her father or even her opinion to all other people and how does she feel about everything because she is too scared about what could happen to her if she manifests uh, her, her own thoughts about it. But in some years she goes to university, she falls in love with this guy who is a revolutionary. And actually uh, his hero is her father. So he has read all these uh, uh, poet, uh, poetry and he also interprets them as revolutionary. And they fell in love uh, and he be, uh, starts confronting her for not having an opinion, for not talking, for not expressing her thoughts, for not getting involved in one of the sides of the story. And then, and then, one day, <laughs> this revolutionary boy prepare your day and separate your day in the family, prepare the protest, your work, go to the protest, and the protest, listen to win. <sighs> and call the girlfriend. I want to meet in you, say. It's totally necessary. Take one decision. Tian. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Eva, I want you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit of the work that you were doing so far here. I'll start by the work we were doing because what brought our group together was this idea of state narratives and the kind of dominance and the ways in which <clears throat> it may kind of impact our individual um, decision making. Um, but we were very specifically dealing with particular narratives that deal with state oppression. And so what does that do to self-censorship um, what does that do when you're working under a situation where fear or paranoia is a factor? Um, what does that do when, when you have to kind of consider um, being exiled from your community? And, and, and in turn, what are the strategies that are then being used um, to, to work under those circumstances? So where I fit into the picture is that I, um, my background is as a visual artist and art historian, um, but uh, Juan <laughs> so generously called me a, his a history hacker before, um, and really that is a strategy that I attempt to use as a visual artist, um, as a conceptual artist, is how do we write in narratives, um, particularly um, narratives of marginalized people, um, narratives from the global south, narratives that are not part of these dominant histories, and how do we intervene into those existing structures as a, as a form of subversion, and as a form of making our voices heard. Thank you very much. Thank you all for sharing your story. Um, now what we're going to do is that on the groups that, we are, it, it, that uh, have been formed around the tables, we're gonna keep exploring that. We're gonna ask questions on responsibility, vulnerability, the state oppression and the self-censorship, and the sense of um, narratives of control on um, the way that we deal with our relationships. So the people that are there already telling the story, they are gonna guide the questioning process. So we're gonna ask questions and try to guide the questions in different scales. So we're gonna go first with what can we think that um, drives us to control ourselves in terms of vulnerability at the scale of the individual. Then we're gonna move very fast to the community and then we're gonna try to see how this manifests in the city, in the images and the sounds that we see 
and how that is interrelated, okay? So we're gonna give it just a couple of minutes in each of the scales to see what other questions new you can bring into the table and what other experiences from your own life you can put into the table, okay? So, go. To the people in the audience, if you want to come down and then experience the tables around, that would be fantastic. Because I don't want you to miss part of the experience. And then you can shift between one and the other and see the discussion. There is still some benches here, if you want. There's plenty of chairs, please, come down. Go, go to one of the tables. Do you want to go down to the, there's, there's plenty of chairs still. What do you guys think? I mean, how that question is brought to you? Because it's not about the answers that you already found, it's about the questions they found, and how you guys also have the experience on your side. So, in your, from your side, has, can you bring any experience of vulnerability in which you sense that vulnerability was felt like a, weak, a weakness?
Okay, one, one, let, let's compress again. Let's, let's, com let's compress here so that we follow the structure a little bit of what is happening on the table. So at this point, from the audience, if you have any questions to the stories or from each of the tables that we have now, um, what kind of questions are related to the idea of community and narratives of control? What can you bring in terms of the way of questioning a narrative of control and, and try to understand it? Anyone? From the work that we have been already doing, where do you start to understand a narrative of control in terms of the scale of the community? What are the main concepts that will bring us to try to understand the first relationship to that in your experience on each of the cases? Thank you so much. So I'm, uh, I'm very curious about this uh, question of control. In, in those cases that we, we discussed earlier, where you showed us this image movie of so-called emergent intelligence, of local intelligence, where groups organize themselves in a way that doesn't um, it doesn't imply a single leader. Uh, so this is the case where somehow organisms follow a simple rule, simple principle. Those birds that you saw flocking, they essentially try to keep distance, uh, the same distance between one member on the left and another on the right. And this way they form this pattern spontaneously. It's called emergent intelligence. Emergent intelligence. Um, do you think of that as a case of control? Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question. What do you think in terms of how those collaboration and control are kind of part of the same uh, paradigm somehow? Like in the same way that we can collaborate, we can be controlled. Anyone has an opinion or a thought on that? How is that precisely this flock that we were seeing, that we were being, that we were doing? It's at the same time the way that we can collaborate to narratives of resistance, but it's the same way in which if some pieces of story are found that can make us flock in a different direction. It's going to bring us to emerge in a different shape in terms of control and the way that they want to give us. Anyone has an, a, a thought of that? On how a little story can actually shift us and in the same way that we as collaborators can, if we are not reflecting what we are doing, follow certain trends? No? No thoughts on that? Um, I think our story perhaps offers an answer. Um, so it's very interesting because the main character, Clara, um, went by caring for her cat, um, manages to assert a certain amount of control over her life, which was previously a mess. Um, but the act of taking care of a cat shows a sort of seeding of control. In a way, it's a risk. She invests all this effort and love and care into this cat who may end up dying. Um, so I think that's, this is this kind of contradictory element. Um, whenever we collaborate with individuals and cede a certain amount of control, um, we gain the benefit of the power that comes with acting as a collective. I'm not sure if this really makes sense, but yeah. Thank you. It totally makes sense because that's exactly what Sergei was pointing to, the fact that actually trying to keep a certain distance, like actually in the flocks, and, and it happened here, but when you're trying to simulate a flock, you don't try to simulate the path of every bird. You're trying to basically do what you're doing here. You make them move in a certain way and you give them an instruction. Don't get too close to the one on the left, don't get too close to the one on your right, and when, the, when you feel the wind, because actually that's the study that has been done so far, that it's actually the feeling of the wind of the wings of the other one shifting, and that makes you shift immediately and this is how they flow. So it's these minimum flows of air that actually make us change. So how can we think in terms of these minimum flows of air, both to understand the control over us, and then also how can we shift those to take power from those that actually assert those narratives of control? So to shift that into the other side, because it's the same 
mechanism. So resistance and uncontrol work within the same kind of flow of events. Okay? So now let's go back to the tables, and if there is any question, let's just put it and bring it to the tables. Okay? Let's continue the conversation. How can you use the same mechanism to make one little thing shift everything into transforming into a narrative in which you empower people, in which you put them, their decisions? But that's the second part. It's because that's, if I tell you the good family, someone put it in your mind, and the decisions that you're making are based on that image that you're perceiving. But it might not be a story that you have in your mind. It's something that maybe someone historically put in you, or be the working girl, like in one of the stories, or be careful or be caring. But sometimes that is making you make those shifts into your life that are particular and that are shifting your entire decision making in those different groups. Mm -hmm. That's the narrative of control. What we are trying to investigate and find is the narrative of resistance. Mm -hmm. So it's two different concepts. It's, not. it's how we shift from the control into the resistance with the same mechanism. Because that's the whole model. You see, and, you see, if I understand, if we flow like this, and that triggers it, a flow, the flow is flowing, but it can be used for control, but then we can shift. In these times in which we feel uh, powerless, we can use the same mechanism into the world. That's the whole thing. part at least of what we are trying to investigate. So the idea that sometimes we are unaware of the way that we behave and why, and what are those forces that are kind of shifting our behavior even when we are not realizing it. 
and sometimes we say, we say, for example, I know I'm very happy or I'm very, very, very uh, entertaining, but that sometimes becomes uh, a way of control. I mean, we arrive to a place and we need to be that kind of person constantly and forcefully, and then suddenly we are exhausted, but we still keep doing it, and we bring ourselves to that point in which it's just falling from us, right? And this is where the narrative is controlled. It takes what we are, it takes the flow in which we behave, and then just shifts it in such a way. So imagine that this flow is happening, and then you put a tree on the way, and then they will just shift a bit. But then the entire flow suddenly, because we know that then when one shift shifts the other, will transform. And this is how precisely the narrative of controller works. The question, and this is the investigation that we are trying to get, is how can we change that? How can we use flow, and what kind of stories can bring us to create new ideals of success, new ideals of failure, in which vulnerability is a trait and not a weakness, in which vulnerability is a way of communication and not a way in which we die or survive. Vulnerability is actually a way in which we can communicate to each other, be open to each other, in, and, and in that we become strong. There is no way of going from community to city and as a macro-organism if we are not able to be vulnerable. You know, it's the metaphor of a sphere versus a um, very rough edge kind of shape. The rough edge will have points of contact. The sphere, which is what we sometimes are trying to be, the perfect happy person, the perfect wife, the perfect daughter, the perfect man, or whatever it is, it's a sphere that doesn't allow to break those patterns. Yeah, like, doom. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's a, a little bit what, if you're facing the people, then suddenly, how are they feeling? There's one thing that within the research, I didn't bring it so much, but it's the idea of metacognition. Metacognition. The idea of metacognition is basically this. You don't know what I'm thinking of you, but you're imagining it. And then constantly, the cycle is never, is never complete. I will never see through your eyes, but I'm trying to assess what you were thinking of me, what you're thinking of me, what you're thinking of me. And that is bringing my energy to be putting, trying to understand the metacognition. And at the end, this is how I negotiate my presence. This is how I negotiate my psychology. Always trying to understand how other people think of me. This is what we were talking about, feedback loop, which is basically I go back and then I calibrate and I think what you're thinking of me and then I am, and then suddenly, before I was super happy and then suddenly I'm feeling that you're looking at me in a certain way and, I'm, and then my voice starts trembling. And then, and then this is how we start shifting, little by little. It's just cues, little detail, little, little cues and that makes that we shift. How can we change that? And why am I nervous but that you're looking at me? Because I'm imagining and I'm connecting it to a particular story. And this is what we're trying to investigate. Of course, this is very short time, but it's to trigger those ideas of how can we investigate a narrative that is, has, has power over us and how can we maybe challenge it and resist it and bring that flow into a different direction. Because that's what I think we have the power as storytellers, like to bring these stories that actually can make someone just shift to a different place, to transform in a different way. But to do that, to hack them, we first have to know them. You know, we have to first like understand where those narratives are kind of connected to us. Um, okay, but I didn't want to take the voice too much in the conversation, so. But um, on the other hand, um, like, it could be also dangerous to do it in a, like a reckless way, because then you can try to change your behavior like uh, as something that makes you vulnerable and then you do something reckless to like compensate it and you say like, oh no, I'm not vulnerable, so I'm gonna like, I don't know, run naked around and fuck on the clock. And then, <laughs> that's just a stupid idea. But then you come back to yourself and you're like, I didn't do that, that was reckless, that was stupid. This is like, uh, this is super interesting because for example, in one of the stories before on the group, there was someone that was sharing a moment in which she felt always like she needed to be super careful, be super careful. And at some point, to compensate that, he just was super reckless and did something super stupid because he was afraid of heights and then suddenly he puts himself in the worst situation that someone not afraid of heights would have not put himself. The thing is that's still part of the narrative of control. The compensation is that as well part of the narrative of control. If we, I don't feel successful, I will work double the time. Yeah. If I don't feel um, pretty, then I will always be looking myself in the mirror. And this is part of narrative of control. It's not only the part in which I feel good or I feel bad, it's the moment in which I'm compensating and creating myself around that narrative. And that's a little bit the, the complicated part. The question and really the question here is, taking in consideration that we're overcompensating, how can we change the metaphor? 
what kind of metaphors in terms, for example, of what we're talking about here, vulnerability, how can we challenge that? I mean, that's the question now on the table. How can we challenge the idea that vulnerability is weakness? What kind of story, what kind of idea, what kind of um, character could make us see that vulnerability is not a weakness? And that we can internalize that. So that the next time that we feel vulnerable, we feel like, yeah, it's part of me. So what? You know, it's me. How can we change, challenge that? Well, the thing is, and of course, this is a process that you can do forever and ever and ever in the terms of like uh, kind of the, the time. The time frame that we have right now, it's very, very brief, yeah? But, but precisely what we, are, what we have to do with these questions is that's at the level of the community. Mostly what we're trying to do is the, the, the level of the individual is try to not use the mic because you're over on the screen. <laughs> From the level of the community, how can we go into the level of the people? So how these things manifest, how the things that we were just talking about manifest at the level of the people? I can tell you the example. I'm from Mexico and we are a very insecure and vulnerable country. So that comes into a collective. As an individual, we feel degraded as a country because we, we, we were a colonized country and we are a colonized country mindset, economic state, politically, culturally, etc. So the symbol and the vulnerability that I feel as a person, I can be reflected into my community, which is my country, and in my community, which is my whole continent, which is Latin America. So I think that's the way that we can take that into the, the matter of the society. No, it's the exploration of this narrative, and now we have to see how that narrative is manifested on the community and the ecosystem, but if you have ideas, you can bring it on the table so that we go from one scale to the other. Do you have any questions that is bringing that particular narrative into uh, one of the scales? No, it's fine. Okay. So, following that path, how can we go into a different scale? How can we see, in that story of vulnerability, and weakness, and the feeling of weakness and having to work and so on, how can we see the patterns that go into a different scale? How can we translate one personal story into how we move in the city, in how the images that we see are part of that narrative of control? But what city, what images in the city, what kind of structures in the city are feeding that narrative of vulnerability if we can see? What images do you see in the media? What kind of patterns when you move on, on the train, what kind of images on the politics bring you to think vulnerability is weakness? Sorry, just look at advertising. Mm -hmm. What are the messages that are being sent to people on, on the advertisement? What are the messages that we see that are feeding our reaction to vulnerable versus weakness? I mean, I speak personally to drones. And yeah, but that, that's, the, that's, a, that's a question to the table. What images are we seeing on a macro scale, on a daily basis, that are connecting us to that? Okay, that's great. It's always everywhere. But that is, I think, a starting point, I should say, a description of the future. No, but you're bringing a different frame, for example, mm -hmm. architecture. Yeah. How is that architecture actually is bringing us to that idea that when we're using certain materials and certain architectural structures, mm -hmm. that's good, that's power. How does power rep is represented in, in, in our cities? Mm -hmm. 
is not through fluid structures, it's not through gentle structures, it's about the same metaphor. It's the metaphor of strength, of not being vulnerable, of not being fluid. And so that's the kind of question, like what other things we see that are representing strength, if we're gonna go in the other direction to see where that is represented. Sure, in advertisement, when we see the kind of image of the perfect people that have no vulnerability, but architecture is a perfect example. Which is that, that's, that's, that's very, very and the coming modernities are very strong. That's very interesting. And oh. So that's very interesting because it's both the image on the
Um, hello. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Um, just one note here because we have to close uh, the session. Unfortunately, this fast is very fast. And of course, we're still grasping and trying to understand what is the way to understand something as complex as the narrative of control, but also how the methods can work in terms of that. So let's do a little quick recap, okay? We started with very personal stories in which we already tried to embed some elements that will bring us to think in different areas of knowledge. But how, can you put this slide again, please? Thank you. How, how you will construct that process will be precisely to understand one single narrative, could be a character, could be a pinpoint in one of the stories, and then in this case will be at the level of the individual, right? And then you start understanding how is the language affecting that person in terms of that narrative of control, for example. What the words, the structures, because each language has a structure of power. The architecture, we were talking here, for example, and we'd love to, to hear if you have any other notes, but like how architecture is bringing also an image of strength and the anti-vulnerability, and is bringing us to already feel in space in a different way. We were thinking about slogans, like the self-made woman, the strong kind of family, the happy family that needs to be uh, fulfilled, and how that actually is bringing us to not share with others. Again, not language, but communication. So the atomization of the particular structure and how we are not sharing with each other and that's bringing that the flow, it's not in our hands, but it's in the hands of those narratives. So by sharing and actually trying to understand how we can deconstruct or change that flow, we could start changing and transmitting a different set of narratives. But to understand that and in terms of the methods, that's what we will do. We will start with one story and we will start with one scale and then we will go to questions that are pertinent to the other scale, the other scale, the other scale, and we will map these relationships into space, yeah? Not writing, mapping. So we'll try to pinpoint little pieces of notes, research, we will ask people, we will bring different experts, we will ask a linguist that will try to understand that, that with which we will try to understand how that it's affecting us, we will think in terms of biology, what the kind of needs or the kind of sensations or the kind of perceptions that are bringing us to um, a certain type of um, understanding, nutrition, civic action, politics. This knowledge, and this is what we're trying to do, gather as much knowledge as possible, it's also the way in which we will hack that kind of system, in which we will think, and then an interesting conversation we were having is, Maybe a, a, another education system can be. Yep, but that's just one institution within a flow that is bringing us in, in, in power to what the narrative of control is trying to do. So it's how that do we fight those narratives that are embedded in many different institutions, in many different categories, by trying to understand the system as a whole. So methodically, we will go always trying to understand at what scale that relationship is, and then always see what questions we have not made at the different kind of scales. And we will try to visualize them. And that by visualizing them and understand the relationships between the parts. So we, we don't work linearly. We will work in a map similar to this, that it's beginning to grow and that is beginning to show the relationships between advertisement and language, architecture and flow, self-image and eating, and so on and so forth, okay? Is there any questions regarding like the presentation of the process that we were doing here from the people of the audience that joined us? This is obviously a presentation of a method that it's a new set of strategies that it's to tell you a way in which we have been working for several years, but it's also a way of telling you Try to be holistic in the way that you approach the stories, but also holistic in the way that you try to approach the comprehension of the world, to try to weave the different scales in which you are working. Um, we're gonna close now because we are out of time. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for sitting with us and work on this uh, exercise of the comprehension of narrative of control. And I hope, um, that um, what we have presented to you now can trigger 
new ideas and new set of thoughts in terms of how we live, but also how can as storytellers bring change with the stories that we create. Okay, so thank you very much.